thank you for the kind introduction so my topic is uh, perioperative frailty so we first of all define what is frailty if you look at the uh, dictionary definition it just indicates weakness but the proper definition would be frailty is a biologic syndrome of decreased reserve and loss of resistance to external stressors resulting from cumulative declines across multiple physiologic systems and causing vulnerability to adverse outcomes so it's very important to note that there is decline among multiple physiologic systems like the physical the cognitive the social and the biological domains and it leads to adverse outcomes if you look at the incidence you can see that the incidence increases along with the age of the patient and the increasing age there is decreasing in the functional capacity of the patient and it leads to dependency if you look at the population in the world in 2015 you can see india the percentage of uh, elderly people is less than 10% but in 2020 it is predicted that we will have a population of around 300 million who are elderly so around 10 to 30% of our population is going to be elderly what about kerala if you look at the situation in kerala kerala is aging faster than rest of india and you can see that by 2050 we'll have 35% of population who are more than 65 years and if you look at the district wise uh, distribution presently you can see that patnamthitta has the largest amount of people with uh, more than 60 years so what are you faced with you're going to be faced with a silver tsunami in the operating rooms so you'll have people with silver colored hair and you'll have to treat them now the interest in frailty has exponentially risen the publications have risen since 2015 and so this is a relatively new topic and presently we have two journals for discussing frailty alone that is in 2012 the journal of frailty in aging was started publishing and the journal of frailty sarcopenia and falls in 2016 and 10 days from now we have even a conference on sarcopenia and frailty so that is the importance of frailty why should we be worried about frailty that's because a lot of studies have shown that the cost of surgery is very high when frail patients are being taken up for surgery their length of stay is more they have they end up in institutional care their 30 day readmission is higher and the functional decline when compared to a frail patient is higher when they undergo surgery and the mortality definitely is higher so all these factors play a big role and that is why we should be worried across the spectrum of specialties whether it is general surgery whether it is emergency general surgery or even orthopedic surgery the post operative complications the 30 day readmission rate the length of stay everything is double that of a non frail patient including in cardiac surgery also so all these shows us that frail patients are definitely at at risk even the icu patients if there is frailty added on to their comorbidities their mortality is much higher now if you interview these elderly people they will tell that they require two things that is they would like to live independently and they would like to return to the activity that they were performing before so before their pre morbid state what they were they would like to return to that so this is the requirement of most of the elderly patients and they value this more than survival and as anesthesiologist it is very pertinent that we be we are very careful about give, of maintaining patient safety and if you look at it it's often cited as the only specialty in healthcare to have reached the six sigma defect rate that is it is used to describe a 99.99966% defect free process so we are champions of providing patient safety so it is very important that we stress upon the concept of surgical pause so always you risk stratify patients who come for patients with frailty and make a surgical pause because surgeons are always interested in doing their patients fast so always get a risk assessment mitigate the risk and have a risk informed shared decision you should present to the patient that there are other 
non-operative management techniques or you will have to undergo a prehabilitation before going for surgery. So now this picture here shows you a physically robust patient and since he has a good physiological reserve, he in spite of these physical, uh, in spite of all these uh, insults, he is able to compensate adequately. But that is not the case in a frail patient. Here you can see that the patient goes in for the, the balance is tilted in favor of decompensation. Till now I have told you that frailty is a disease of the elderly, but it is not so. If you look at this uh, study, there are other studies also from coming out from critical care. They found that it is not exclusively a disease of more than 65. They have found that when patients are between 50 to 65 years, when they are admitted, they had a higher adjusted mortality rate at one year and there was greater use of healthcare resources. Now this is another uh, picture showing you a hospitalized older surgical patient when he's faced he's faced with many challenges during his journey through the surgery and recovery period and look at this individual a this is a normal patient he has good sorry he has good functional uh, capacity and he gets he undergoes suppose he undergoes a appendicectomy you can see that he returns back to the pre-morbid level of his functional status now you look at this blue line that is patient c he's a moderately fra frail patient now he undergoes, suppose he undergoes a, a, okay, a colorectal surgery and you can see that he, during the post-operative period, he is dependent on others and he returns back after a certain time to back to a functional ability but you can see that he doesn't return to the same pre-morbid level. And what about patient B? He is only a mildly frail patient. Suppose he, go, he undergoes the first insult of a major uh, emergency surgery like a peptic ulcer perforation with uh, sepsis, he goes into a dependent state, he recovers slowly and suddenly he gets a second insult of a post-operative pneumonia. You can see that his functional capacity just drops and he may even die. And you can see that he never returns back to a state where, his, uh, where he is functionally independent. Now this is the vicious cycle of frailty. Now frail patients, they are all, uh, they have chronic undernutrition, they have anorexia of aging and they all have loss of muscle mass sarcopenia which leads to decreased strength which leads to decreased activity and back to chronic nutrition so, sorry chronic malnutrition so there is a basic difference between sarcopenia and cachexia now this is something confusing so all you have to know is in sarcopenia there is muscle wasting whereas in cachexia there is in addition to muscle wasting there is fat and bone loss and Regarding the muscle 2, in sarcopenia, it's a type 2 fiber reduction, whereas in Kachex, it's a type 1 fiber reduction with intrafibular edema. Now, this is just showing you the basic difference between Kachex and that is what I showed you picturally. Now, assessment of frailty is very important. And assessment is basically, there are two conceptual models. And the first one is the frail phenotype that was introduced by Linda Fried. And she basically says that there are five different components. And the other one was from the Canadian group of uh, Ken Rockwood. And he said that a lot of defects, uh, deficits are accumulated once you grow, uh, once you become elderly. And there are different assessment tools. Now, these are a few of the uh, assessment tools, the frail phenotype, the frailty index, the risk analysis index, and the frail scale and the clinical frailty scale. Now, if you look at the fra freed fra frailty, there are basically five things. And if you have like uh, weight loss, weakness and fatigue, poor endurance, weakness and fatigue is tested by grip strength using a dynamometer. And low activity levels and slow gait speed, if you have more than three, you're considered to be frail. And this presence of uh, frailty was independently predictive of uh, incident falls, worsening mobility, hospitalization, and even death. This is the list of accumulating deficits. So what was introduced first was a 70 uh, item model, but now it has been increased to 92. And frailty index is deficits present divided by deficits measured. So for example, if you have seven deficits out of the 70, you have a 0.1 frailty index. So anything that is more than 0.3 is considered to be frail and more than 0.67 is not compatible with life or independent life. So these two models were really uh, 
labor intensive so they came out with other models that is the clinical frailty index where you have seven scales and it's a subjective uh, determination by the clinician and here you can see that as the frailty score increases the so does the probability of survival the probability of survival will decrease later we came up with the frail scale the frail scale is nothing but a combination of the two conceptual models there are two conceptual models which i told you so four items are taken from the phenotype model and one item is taken from the accumulating deficit model so the illness the frail f r a i l the illness is from the accumulating deficit model and if you have more than 3 you become or you are labeled as frail and this has shown to be very recently in 2022 uh, article in anesthesia analgesia it has been shown that it's a very uh, suitable preoperative frailty screening tool the risk analysis index there are two types there is risk analysis index c which is clinical and the risk analysis index a that is administrative the administrative one is taken up from the electronic health records and this is considered to be very good for clinically assessing these patients a maximum score of 81 and if you have anything more than 36 14 questions are answered and you you are labeled frail edmonton frail scale is another one and that's nine criteria is used and there are now apps to dis, uh, determine whether patients are frail and this meta analysis showed that uh, clinical frailty scale was the one which was which is the best now there are a lot of serum markers which we use in routine clinical practice like the serum albumin which is low the c reactive proteins are high you have vitamin d deficiency and there are high levels of serum transferrin and fibrinogen and there are some uh, serum markers the pro inflammatory cytokines which are elevated that is the interleukin 6 and the tumor necrosis factor alpha and lower levels of insulin growth factor and there are reduced expression of sir twins you can also use anthropometry measurements to determine frailty but it is not very precise in females now you have some radiological tools like uh, you can use the ct level uh, you can use the ct image at the abdomen of pelvic ct at l3 level you can see the one here you can see this the the muscle that is marked in red is the psoas muscle and uh, this is the vertebrate uh, l3 level and the one the picture b is showing you the muscle mass is reduced but uh, the bone density is maintained so this is sarcopenia and here the muscle mass is maintained but there is uh osteopenia and in figure d there is both sarcopenia and osteopenia the other muscle that is commonly tested is the masseter at the uh, sigmoid uh, level uh, and the masseter muscle at the zygomatic bone just below the zygomatic bone you can see here this is a frail patient the other one is the normal one you can also use the uh, brain atrophy index where you measure the intercordate distance divided by the uh width of the uh, bra- uh, the brain and uh, you can find out uh, the uh, brain atrophy index another uh, modality is using the ultrasound which is commonly available in our theaters you can or in the pac clinic you can measure the uh, there is actually they have uh, suggested a nine point muscle but uh, it is very difficult to measure nine muscles so you just measure the rectus femoris at the mid level of the uh, thigh So how do you improve outcomes for older surgical patients with frailty there is no silver bullet so you have to find the contributors of frailty and then devise an evidence based optimization strategy so this is what is advised if any patient above 65 if he is above 65 do a frailty assessment if frailty is present you look at the nutrition the mental health the cognition and the physical status malnutrition is very common in elderly people and because of uh, malnutrition you can have complications prolonged length of stay and impaired functional recovery so you should address the macro and micronutrient deficits and what are the tools available you can check the bmi history of weight loss you can look at the canadian nutrition screening tool which is commonly used and if your answers are yes to two of these that means you are at risk of nutritional uh, problem so the perioperative guidelines are to we recommend 1.5 grams per kilogram per day of uh, protein identify uh, if there is you know, iron deficiency please do supplement that and immunonutrition is also like supplementing arginine omega 3 fatty acids 
cognitive dysfunction definitely is uh, prevalent among mild cognitive dysfunction is there and this uh, leads to the development of post-operative delirium. So the mini cog test is uh, advised you have to draw the face of uh, clock and the clock handles and initially before that you will tell the patient three words and he is asked to memorize that and after drawing the clock you ask, you ask him for the recall of the three words and that is the mini cog test and that is done to detect uh, cognitive dysfunction and if it is there it, the patient is at high risk for developing delirium and delirium is uh, definitely a, uh, the most common post-operative complication in the elderly it's closely related to adverse outcomes it is potentially preventable that is one thing so you can uh, especially in the uh, ICUs you can use the noise interventions and the light interventions protocol you can uh, switch off the uh, sounds of the uh, monitors and you can also give uh, you can dim the lights in the ICU and of course you can use the pharmacological treatment now coming to mental health most, most of these patients are uh, can have uh, anxiety and depression so that can be detected using the personal health questionnaire and once it is there you should try to treat these patients by uh, try, to, try to treat them so that because if they are going to an institutional home it's going to have problems so you have to treat them early similarly physical performance now if you most of these patients after surgery they end up with post-operative immobility even a normal adult a healthy older adult can lose up to 1.5 pounds of muscle mass per week so you can imagine how much muscle mass the frail patient would lose so it's very important to identify this subset of people and the tools available are the duke activity uh, status index where you find out uh, around 12 questions are there and you can calculate the oxygen consumption Similarly, you can use the tug test. The tug test is the patient is asked to sit and he's asked to, she's, he or she is then asked to walk around, uh, he, she's asked to walk around three meters and then turn back and come back and sit. You should do this in 12 seconds. If it's less than 12 seconds, you are frail. I don't know how many of us will be able to do it. Now then there's the 30 second chair stand. You're supposed to sit on a chair, cross your hands uh, uh, and then stand and sit. In 30 seconds, how many times you will be able to sit and stand? And for 65, and there is, it has been graded according to the age. So if it's less than 15, you are considered to be frail. So what will you do for all these patients who are considered frail? You have to, once identified such patients may benefit from prehabilitation, which has been shown to decrease your complication rates and possibly improve functional outcomes by enhancing the functional capacity. We have a talk on prehabilitation prehabilitation but still for the frail patients what they do is aerobics or high intensity training resistance training nutrition and mindfulness it's done three to six weeks before surgery and two to three weeks uh, two to three times per week it is supposed to improve the functional status now there are studies in major abdominal surgery in high-risk patients where a motivational interview personalized exercise programs supervised high intensity endurance training all leads to increased aerobic capacity and decreased post-operative complications and this is extended for up to three months but there is a controversy is it prehab or rehab now frail patients in canada where uh, who are awaiting colorectal resection were randomized to four weeks of prehab and four weeks of rehab that is those who had prehab did not have rehab and those who had rehab did not have prehab and ultimately what was found that there was no difference in the 30 day complication so are we justified in using those making these patients wait for four weeks so a new trial is coming out the cope ios trial which could give us the result and there the patients undergo training as well as they are given an ipad and they play games and that's supposed to increase the cognitive level so prehabilitation has its own challenges because we are not yet sure about the dose, the timing, the cognitive changes, and it is resource intensive. And are we justified in making these patients wait for four weeks? And what is the uh, thing that is going to reduce mortality is the comprehensive geriatric assessment. And this is done in five domains, medical, environmental, functional, and psychological and social and what do you do in that the comorbid conditions the medicine review nutritional status and in all these domains things are taken up and a stratified problem list is made and then an individualized management plan is there and goals are there and this becomes a continuous circle because it is it is a repetitive phenomenon and the patient is continuously followed up for the next three to six months and there are a lot of meta-analysis which have shown benefit with 
CGA, which is being implemented if you have a geriatric department in your hospital. And this is the one study from BMJ, which has shown that patients who underwent a CGA, the, they had lesser, uh, they had lesser uh, mortality when CGA was implemented. And if you were, had implemented a CGA, they were, uh, it was possible for them to be uh, sent back to home rather than to an institutional care. So the Perioperative frailty team should include the anesthesiologist, surgeon, the geriatrician, social workers, and it should be supported by your hospital. And there are studies which I have done and it has shown that if you implement a targeted care intervention, the 30-day complications and sepsis and respiratory failure, everything is reduced. Just a minute. So anesthetic concerns are our patients, our frail patients, their response to hypovolemia, hypotension, and hypoxia are limited. Lung compliance is decreased arterial oxygen tension is decreased, there is impaired cough reflex, and uh, there is increased susceptibility to hypothermia and excretion function, as well as metabolism is limited. So the concerns are basically in preoperative fasting, we can limit the fasting hours, give them a preoperative uh, pre carbohydrate drink, and of course ask them to use their sensory aids uh, intraoperatively, uh, perioperatively, so in the back in the when they come back into the postoperative or uh, this one, and uh, rapidly moving. So the basically you should risk stratify the period preoperative period, and you should optimize the intraoperative period by employing uh, lung protective protocols, minimize the hemodynamic changes, and also continue to monitor them in the postoperative period. There are a lot of strategies which are employed to prevent frailty. That is the SPRINT trial, which was shown that regular exercise with dietary advice is better, which gives better mobility in frail patients. There is the VV2 trial, and this is one trial which the results might help us. The Do Health, we are awaiting the results, and the Nolan trial where they used uh, arginine, uh, DHA, and antioxidants that were given. It was shown to be useful in the animal studies, and now the uh, studies are going on. Future trials are regarding infusion of mesenchymal cells. It has been shown that these are pluripotent cells which can, uh, you can regenerate muscles. Similarly, you have myostatin inhibitors and uh, these uh, cause hypertrophy of the muscles. So I would like to say that for most surgeons and anesthesiologists, patient frailty is currently the elephant in the operating room. It is easy to spot, but it is often ignored. So concluding, we need future research to further refine interventions for preoperative optimization while addressing knowledge gaps related to intra and postoperative care. So in the spirit of this aforementioned quote by Madam Curie, anesthesiologists will strive to better understand frailty and its clinical and psych psychosocial consequences so that they do not fear frail patients. As the demographic uh, trend is trans, there is a transition happening where a silver tsunami is you're expected so the healthy aging should be the paramount importance. So anesthesiologists and perioperative physicians must do their part to better appreciate this state of increased clinical vulnerability so that they can do more and fear less when rendering clinical care to patients living with frailty. Thank you for your kind attention. I'm sorry for exceeding the time. Thank you Vijay sir for the excellent talk. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, though uh, frailty has been in the limelight for almost a decade now, we are still uh, it's, uh, we still have a far way to go before a frailty assessment makes in makes a place in our routine preoperative assessment. Uh, so, uh, for a suggestion, which uh, frailty assessment scale would you suggest to be most feasible, especially in our clinical setting? Yeah, that's a good question. But since I don't do uh, frailty assessment. I'm not very sure, but, but in the, the meta-analysis the meta or by McIsaac said that the clinical frailty score was the best. But again, it's a subjective one. It is done by the clinician. So it's since this is a uh, little labor intensive to do, I don't know how feasible it will be. So I think we should have a team of people involved rather than the anesthesiologist himself in the PAC doing all this. So I think a team of people, geriatrician, social worker, everybody can sit together. Suppose a frail patient comes and I think if it is done, it is good. The involvement of geriatrician is a major deficit in our hospitals. Yeah. Geriatric department? Geriatric, yeah, we don't have. Uh, the 
topic is open for discussion thank you